Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Poetry Live, hosted at the Erie County Public Library. Uh, I want to thank all of you for showing up again. Uh, looks like we have a little bit of a smaller crowd, but I think that's okay. We, we deserve a little bit of a rest after last week. So yeah, I'm really happy to see you all here. Um, just a couple things. We, we have a little bit more set up normal tonight. We do have a featured reader. Um, and I do also want to talk about another event happening in November, but otherwise it's going to kind of just be like normal. Uh, we're going to have the normal reading where everybody will just read two poems. Again, we have featured readers, so we want to make sure that they get, you know, we're not like going overboard with our own stuff. Uh, but, two, you know, two poems limit, three if they're really short. Um, after that, I'll step up, I'll interview our featured reader, who's Luke Kuz Kuzmish. And uh, after that, there'll be a small interview. Uh, I do want to mention that we are having a poetry symposium on November 17th online uh, on Zoom. Uh, you can just find it, uh, thanks, or find it via the Facebook, uh, library's Facebook. Sorry, there's like a giant spider there. It keeps distracting. It's like hanging from the ceiling. Um, yeah, and we have four speakers. They're all either published poets or publishers. And they're going to talk about their experience in the publishing world. And then they're going to answer questions from our audience, um, which, again, they can be watching live or whatever. But also, anybody here can also submit questions if they want them to be answered there, too. I'll keep talking about that basically every Thursday until then, just to keep us in the loop. But I'm pretty excited about that. OK. Um, once again, I'm really excited tonight. And I'm glad to see you all here. And let's get started. Let's see who our first poet of the night is. Oh, yeah, I guess I, I, guess I am the first poet. <laughs> I'm back. My name's, yeah, since I'm here. Uh, so I am back. Uh, as you noticed, I didn't really leave. My name is Patrick Nuttall. And I wasn't sure I was going to read tonight if we had a bunch of people. But I think we have enough that I definitely can. These are two older poems, but I've been having fun playing with them again, so here we go. Looking for salvation under a bridge in northern Michigan. A turtle lay on its back, scooped out neatly of all organs, and watched me count the silence between car thunder like it was a science, because it was, or I needed it to be. Yes, there was a church up the road, and the pastor might sit me down, tell me about resurrection and Mary, or the three denials. I would drink peppermint tea, and he would smile. This happened once, or something like it. Instead, I filled the turtle with stones. I could have graphed out the formula for sainthood, or stood outside the bridge. It would not have changed how, when I asked if one could die without regret, the river rose suddenly into its mouth. Okay. Thank you. OK. And this is called Afternoon Fireworks Set Off in My Neighbor's Lawn. I was a child once and buried M80s to the fuse among the bricks out back before the house burnt down. And for a second, I burnt it down right then Dirt and clay burst upward, and yes, I was laughing with friends. Who am I to protest happy destruction? When they stop, I will be far away, counting times a car circles the cafe, the driver flush, knowing they are lost or looking. I will bend, inhaling the Darjeeling first flush. A beautiful man in dark shoes will ask what I want mean, why are you here? I'll trace the seam of the red web cloth on the table and ask the woman across from me, baklava again. We have all heard the story, someone dead after being struck by fireworks, the reds or greens of celebration fused to the hair. The headline is always tragedy. This will be me, if not fireworks, heart disease or depression. I sit my lager, a dog barks, 
His owner yells. Children scream outside in the road. Thank you. Hello. My name is Mabel Howard, and I'll be sharing two poems today. So the first one was inspired by a mural um, on the side of a building on Sassafras Street. So here it goes. I'm the one who's blind, yet you struggled to see me until I was painted on the side of a building facing Sassafras Street. It's easier to see our differences, although we all eat, sleep, and breathe. Perhaps it makes one feel different, not being tagged with a disability. Disabilities come in all shapes and sizes, but so do unique gifts. This fact inspired me to write a poem that would end with a unique twist. A blind man can hear better than the average man you see. When one sense is taken, the others are more awakened. Fascinating, wouldn't you agree? It's senseless to be insensitive to anyone that is in need of understanding and kindness, simple things. My hearing aid must have given you a hint that when I stare at you, I'm reading your lips. You probably thought I was interested, but you couldn't be further than wrong. I write music and lyrics, although I'll never hear a song. But it's easier to see our differences, although we all eat, sleep, and breathe. Perhaps it makes one feel better not being tagged with a disability. Thank you. And the next one. Uh, this was actually inspired by an online prompt session. Um, it's called I Believe. The prompt was I Believe. I believe that we are all born free and throughout our lives we attach ourselves to things. These things become our everything, putting invisible shackles on our reality, leading to a mentality that appears to be right for now because it satisfies current needs or perhaps what others believe that you should receive. Minimum or less because this is how it's been set a loop for you to use as a news. All the options positions you to be a fool, used by those who will benefit from your loss of having to have those things. Thank you. Well, I'm Danny Mitchell. This is the political poetry portion of the program, and I'm your host, Arthur Van Gogh. Tonight is a continuation of the theme, writing a poem about work, and I'm writing about two new jobs here. This one, the first one is called Vacuum Pump Assembler. And I did this job after I got back from Fall River and it turns out I was getting in at the bottom of a uh, high-tech industry uh, boom. And the vacuum pumps are used to make a machine called an ion implanter. And the ions are what they use to make circuit boards small. They use the ions as wire. And it's a very complicated issue. And we just made a machine and we only made part of the machine. We made the vacuum pumps that suck all the air out of the machine so they could bombard it with ions. So <laughs> we were part of the high-tech industry, but still doing the low-tech work. And I ended up being a silkscreen printer of in, in, uh, instrument panels while I was there. And I worked in the machine shop for a while. 
So, but they eventually the bubble popped and they went out of business. So that's how this, this story ends. But uh, I'll, it's a short poem because there was a short life there. It's called Vacuum Pump Assembler. When the high tech industry came to town, I got in on the ground floor. Verizon was their name and that's who I assembled pumps for. Welding and machining departments were soon staffed and running strong. In a year, we had 100 workers, non-union, but not for long. In the day I would work, at night I would talk with people, with all the people, excuse me, about wages and raises and health plans we shared that were feeble. The health and safety issues suddenly started getting everyone's attention. Because of all the injuries, we started that union drive I mentioned. As a committee, we were growing, getting stronger every day, but the company had other plans and constantly got in our way. But this was the 80s, and when the high-tech bubble popped, Varian lost out the competition and had to close the shop. And that's the vacuum pump assembler. <laughs> This next one is, uh, sounds funny, but it's actually a real job. I was an assistant calendar operator. And that sounds weird. I know you think I'm the guy who turns the page every 30 days, but that's not what kind of machine it was. This is calendar spelled with an E-R, and according to Funk and Wagnall, it's to press calendar, to press between rollers or plates to make thin sheets. And that's what I did in uh, the rubber industry with Goodyear. I was an assistant calendar operator, and the calendar was, it would go up to the stage here, up to the top of this stage, and it had three big rollers that were always hot. And the rubber would turn through these three rollers that were all mechanical, and eventually it would squeeze out a five foot long, half inch thick stream of rubber that we would roll up at the end. That was my job, rolling it up and putting it on a roller. And it was all heavy industry, lots of heat. The machine, was, they always had to be like 300 degrees hot, you know, to keep the rubber from sticking and all the silly stuff. So here I was, a calendar operator for Goodyear. It wasn't just the heat I hated. I couldn't believe the noise, the grinding and churning of giant gears rumbled through the air. In the middle of all this chaos, I had to keep my poise, wearing a hard hat, steel toes, and earplugs. They were mandatory there. The humongous steel rollers were kept very, very hot because the rubber being made liked it that way. It didn't matter what we laborers thought. At Goodyear, the rubber ruled the day. The operator would ring his bell, it was real loud, and act one would start flowing in this industrial opera. Raw rubber running up to the conveyor to the steam-induced clouds now cascades down through the rollers of the calendar. In act two, we remove the rubber from the bottom of the roller. It takes two men. We each grab an end and give it a pull. The rubber comes free and lays down on the canvas conveyor and gets rolled up on steel beams into 25-foot rolls. In the final act of this product's passion play, we lift our 25 feet of rubber and steel with hooks and hoist, we whisk it away, fill up the rack for a day's pay and a free meal. And that was the assistant calendar operator. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Hi, I'm Chuck Joy, and I like a poetry live that has a political poetry portion, and I think it's really convenient because uh, uh, the next edition of Poetry Live will be after Election Day or Y2K or, or whatever, but I'm happy to bring some political poems today and was looking forward to following Danny, so here we go. Um, this first one is a product of considering history and uh, considering a year that might uh, somehow relate to the one we're living now. And uh, here's the poem. 
It's a two-part poem called 1970. One, the enemy, the government, devoted to murder. Murder's passionate apologists, proud of their president, loyal to a fault, determined to maintain their positions. Legislators complicit, upholding the policy of murder, business persons profiting from murder, big tippers at the executive club, pastors preaching murder, sharing that burden with their flock. Two, Loud men in a corner bar, spraying their ignorance over the jukebox, toasting murder with enthusiasm. Slender ladies in cotton dresses, their messages over the television, thrilled by murder, its black and white flames. The future, a dim bulb, weak light on a late train, two students reading the same book, refugees in a failing America. Thank you. Now on a slightly different, uh, from a slightly different tone, this is called Let's Put It Out There. Unity, together, Everybody pulling in the same direction. We're a large group defined by suffrage, the ability to vote, facing the same choice from New Jersey to Honolulu, electing a government to serve us, choosing unity, coming together. Nurture growth, shelter the infirm, Human beings all, every age, sex, color, talent, method of praise, and increasingly additional species. Channeling the energy to improve our community, address inequities, protect our environment, seek balance and harmony, be intelligent regulate our collective behavior. Nobody's perfect, but lead with character. I move we make it unanimous. Thank you. Hi, y'all. I'm Nisi. Um, I was trying to look over some stuff to present, so I think I'll do this one. And I don't even, well, I think I do have a title for this one. I'm going to call this one Women. And usually these ones I wrote, I, I think I wrote these ones when I was in conflict with uh, someone or something, so I was just going over them. All right, this one is called Women. So I figured out why men discreetly hire women. They're paying for them to be quiet women. The be humbled, hush, and tired women. So you and I, we're not the desired women. We are the inside a riot women. The secure the bag and get up out of here type of women. The light anything on fire women. And we will only accept the type of sire women. That's a little bit of one. I don't think I have a title for this one, but I knew where it came from. It came out of um, someone, I guess, was in conflict with me, and they called me a peon. And I kind of went, what? So <laughs> I think I just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote until I got it all out, all the stuff that I wanted to say that I didn't say. So, Okay, this one, I just call it a peon. I think you meant a phenom. Ill, you claim unbeknownst that I'm the antidote, daughter of the royal captive, car captive cargo, 
who chose the comfort of the sea over the assured bondage. A peon? I think you meant a phenom. Blood of the queens who revolted, covered and risen of ash, skilled in altering the atmosphere, powers insurmountable. The sun requests permission to rise and to set. The moon surrenders a phoenix, a peon, you said? I think you meant an icon. Virtuous attributes seen and unseen. Passion causing discomfort. Presence fascinating, vibe intoxicating. A, bl a blinding light so bright, so bright a mountain couldn't block it out. A peon, you say? I'm surely, surely you meant an, a phenom. Authority spanning jurisdictions within a unit of time few possess a frequency to. Levels known only to those having the ability to stand on one's two feet or even one discrediting your own creativity. Shouting peon when I'm sure you meant an icon. One can't imagine walking a mile in those Jimmy Choo's. Four mothers' feet bloodied and bruised, couldn't survive a day without the doctor shows, special reinforcements, back braces, two-face, a peon, you say? I'm sure you meant an icon. Walking the blocks inhabited by the, infam by the infamous cap captives, molded and challenged by those who have seen and met the devil at his door and survived, a peon, surely you meant an icon. Standing guard to those deemed too dangerous to reside and share space with the normies who have yet to been caught. Those who have done the unspeakable things, whisper secrets, finding solace in who? A peon. Possessing abilities that make souls tremble with a, with a gaze or a simple flick of the wrist. Unwarranted debt, attention paid. A peon, you say? An icon. The governor, the preacher man, the mailman, hell, even the corner hustler enchanted by that rhythm myth walk. The illuminating smile and the shea butter smell, it fills the air. A phenom? I'm sure you meant phenom, but you said peon. A freed spirit, ancestrally connected and reciprocated. Having navigated the same lands as Harriet, bearing the life underwater, under the North Star beaming, naturally and alone, not lonely but led by God twice in his successful journey, born free, a peon, you say? I'm sure you meant a phenom. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else in the audience who would like to read before we move to our featured reader? Okay, so I'm gonna introduce Luke first, uh, and then we're gonna get a chance to listen to him read some truly wonderful poetry. Luke Kuz Kuzmish is a poet born and raised in Erie, Pennsylvania. Luke, Luke's poetry has been featured in a number of online and print publications, and, has, and he has published five collections of poems. Uh, his latest collection, titled My Name Does Not Belong to Me, is from Weasel Press and was published in September of 2020. Uh, give me a round of, of uh, a round of applause, welcoming Luke. It's, uh, it's an honor to uh, <clears throat> have been asked during a pandemic to read online and in person. So thank you, Patrick. I don't know if Chuck, do you have anything to do with this? Chuck, Blaine, Cam, you know, all, everyone who's here and watching, um, it's greatly appreciated. I'm going to read a few pieces from uh, my latest book, as Patrick said. Uh, it's called My Name Does Not Belong to Me. I have some copies here if anyone would like to grab one. Uh, and if you're playing along at home, they're available on Amazon. Don't try to spell my last name. My name does not belong to me. It's easier to search. Okay. And I did the, the uh, smallest amount of preparation that I could, which is I dog-eared a couple pages. So um, this library is uh, kind of a special place, and it's featured in this poem. It's called Apples Turning Brown. When I was sniping cigarettes, I learned which ashtrays to hit, 
The ones with women who could only make a half a cigarette. Nurses, secretaries, social workers before they got called back to work. There's nothing effeminate about smoking a discarded cigarette whose filter is covered with lipstick. Or maybe there is, but that part of me, the proud part, I couldn't access while I was fiending. That day I was woken up by a janitor in the back room of the library covered in drool, barely registers as a bad memory. We close in 10 minutes. I hope I thanked him for his kindness, for the way he kept my dignity intact. And when I stepped outside, it started to rain. It always seemed to when I had no place to go. In my brown bag thrown over my shoulder, which held everything I owned, I had some apples turning brown, a gift from my friend. I took a bite and tossed them into the lake. To think I wasn't done trying to fight for this existence of missed shots in my neck, of walking 30 blocks in $3 shoes to find out my dealer wasn't home, the princess was in another castle, of soup kitchen lectures, pity and fish every Friday, of running on dulled instincts, of pulling out my hair in motel bathrooms, of pretending freshman philosophy class was enough to quell the screams of my conscience. Um, at some point in my life, I was introduced to Philip Levine, and uh, I've been a different person every, ever since. This is called Identity. I didn't understand ancestry when I was in my early 20s reading poetry to strangers in a since-dead bookstore that kept looking for its footing in different parts of town. Why would anyone call themselves Irish here when they had been American and only American their whole lives? Was it some unnecessary search for an easy-to-adopt identity when all you may feel like is the city's debris collected on four-lane streets and blown accordingly into the lake along with the belly-up fish shy of regulation and the ducks, the beggars of the bay? Then I read Philip Levine and I wanted to say so badly, I am Harry's grandson, he who sweat in the foundry at Zerns and ate in the delis on Friday. Fried perch bookended by lucky strikes in milky sweet coffee, his spoon chiming a joyous melody, whistling with his paycheck bound for a bucket with a hole in it. I wanted to know the Vietnam draft Fear 1970s of my father who spent high school as a sweat hog and kissed the dirt when the draft ended just before he had to learn what work is. Building meters swallowed up by white brick and greasy black fire escapes waiting for the next layoff, the next foreign owner, the next union president who stood in front of the cameras, the next bone thrown to the dogs, learning the lesson that work is what war is. A sacrifice, a malignant tumor that teaches us it's easier to pay unto Caesar what is his than to be the blind beggar waiting for his Messiah. This is for a friend of mine. It's called Chris. Chris is a poet, short stature, and kind of permanently sad, but not seeking any medication, any quick fix, because I don't think he sees the world or himself as broken, as needing to be fixed. He fishes and smokes light menthols when he can, and he shares what he can, even when he can't. Chris is a sparrow pecking rocks in front of St. Patrick's, anxious, not about death, but about returning to a place he's not sure he has ever been. This is called Aspirational Class, and it's ever an author named Elizabeth Curd Halkett. I hope I said her name right, but I don't think she's going to see this, so... Poor, and he knows it. So when he dies, they'll have a funeral. They'll chip in for a casket, fine wood with brass handles. They'll book flights. They'll buy new dark suits or dark skirts. They'll pack the room and crowd the doorways, fill the ashtrays and empty the candy dish mints. When he dies, a peasant, they'll come to see him as much as they'll come to see one another. Loved ones they all but forgot, forgot how tender they can be, how cheap or how generous, how funny they can be. Faces washed in tears come to drop handfuls of dirt on a peasant's grave. Thank you. I'm going to read a few uh, new ones. Um, don't, you guys get, don't you guys like getting text messages and phone calls about the election? Especially when you're trying to read? <laughs> Ghosts Don't Sing Blues. This is the, uh, hopefully the title of my next book, but this is the title of a manuscript in this poem. 
No, ghosts don't sing blues. The living trade in longing, minds dreaming hearts in shotgun shacks, pining for the yellow hair of a princess whose life is mapped in sagging folds of gray clouds. They never rain on her. But we didn't outrun our storms. We stopped to study their heartbeat lightning sometimes. We hunted them, tracked them like ancient records in rummage sale churches. We sang loud. We sang off key. Our voices stolen sun through broken mini blinds like lightning hopkins. Our feet tapping the angry knock of housekeepers standing in the rain. We sang blues because the ghosts always threatened tomorrow. This is called Before We Sleep. Before we sleep, we count the important things. Dollars in our wallets, cigarettes left to burn, seconds between our breaths, paychecks till Christmas, hours left of night. School teachers or gamblers, we sleep just the same, and we rise. We rise to furnace dead mornings. We rise in our lover's hair. We rise to bad news and bad coffee. We rise in our dead skin, dancing in sunbeams. Here, nothing is wasted. At least, nothing is destroyed. Um, this, I'm going to do two more, I think. This is called To St. Jude Weeping. It will be... An empty gas tank, the mile walk to the gas station in December rain, knives, gravel in your canvas shoe, a biting hangnail which grudges long sleeves, your father's brown leather wallet, empty now, in one gutter or another. What you couldn't say that won't stop ringing wide against homesick canyons, the crawl of minutes waiting for a pawn shop to open, nothing of value but hope. It will be the rust of your bones aching for a quicker calculus, kneeling before someone's door, convinced all life's secrets can fit through a keyhole, the burden of God, light sneaking past the gates of heaven, we idle, comforted only by hoarse prayers to St. Jude weeping. Uh, and this last one, it's called Why I Got Clean. It's for my son, Soren. Your swaying, gentle, and Fisher Price plastic, it's just after midnight, midnight, and thank God you fell asleep. Before you were born, I was obsessed with keeping you away from drugs. I would plan how I could act, what I could say, to stop you from tripping over these genetics. I've been obsessed lately with trying to find a claim from anyone other than me, trying to hitch a ride to prove it's still Kerouac's America. In these nights with you and without sleep, I've been digging through my writings like I used to dig under my bruised skin for a vein, for another shot in a no-tell motel bathroom just north of the highway. And I realize my legacy may be these palms, where I make romance out of your grandfather's suspended prayers, out of your grandmother's sleepless nights, and hurt and the salt from the sweat and tears they wept when my tears came only from watering eyes, the revolution of dope sickness resetting the day. But son, please know, I got clean for a reason. I got clean so your mom would let me back inside the dead-end street house to keep myself warm. That reason was I could feel the walls closing in around me. I could feel the trembling of homelessness, the fact that jail was so close I could taste it. And worst of all, that it would become normalized to me, just like conning had become. But none of that would keep me clean for very long because I had to find faith, something good lie on the other end of the rainbow. May you understand grace, son, but even if you don't, Pray for doors to be opened you never knew were there, and have faith that on the worst day of your life and on the best day of your life, better days are coming. Better days are coming, son. Uh, thank you, Luke. That was fantastic. Um, again, everybody, uh, let's thank Luke for being here. Thank <laughs> you.
Um, and I also want to thank all of you for being here, everybody here and everybody at home. Um, right now, it's a pretty tough time to be anywhere but home. So just the fact that people want to be here to share this with each other, um, I think that's important even, like, no matter what. So uh, I, it was wonderful to see everybody again, wonderful to hear all of this great poem or poetry going around. Uh, I will be having an interview afterwards. People can s stick around if they'd like. Um, otherwise, you're all free to go, and I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, an interview of, for Poetry Live, and we're going to interview Luke Kuzmich, who is the featured speaker tonight. Uh, hello, Luke. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It was an honor. It, it's, so, it's always so great like listening um, to all the posts that come in and out. And this is, you've been here a couple times since I've been here, and uh, I understand that you used to come to the Erie um, Camari ones a lot, too. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool to kind of get to see you do it again. Um, so I did uh, want to ask you a couple questions just sure. for the night. Um, the first one is kind of, I think, a good place to start off. Um, so at this point, you're a pretty accomplished poet. You've published a lot of places. <laughs> I know it's... I, I, sure, uh, sure. You have multiple books. You're like, you do the reading stuff pretty frequently. Um, so, but how did you get into writing poetry in the first place? Or what like prompted you to get into it? That's a tough question. I feel like I, no one's ever asked me that question. And then in the past couple months, I've been asked that probably three times. And yeah. um, it's a, it's a, I know that I've been writing for a long time. Um, I think I was always really attracted to music and lyrics. Um, and poetry was interesting to me. Um, and, you know, I, I probably did it throughout my teenage years. But um, I moved back to Erie in 2012. And I had been writing a little bit off and on. And Poets Hall was open. Um, and a friend of mine had read a piece of mine there. The, pr the proprietor, C. Williams, you know, told him to tell me to come on down anytime. Um, and I felt really welcomed there. I felt like um, it was accessible for me. Uh, and it, it really, it, it was a, a driving force because I, I got to see all these creative people um, reading different types of poetry. And like, it was just very exciting to me. Um, to, and it was kind of this very like, ongoing process you know what i mean it was like yeah. from week to week you could see where what people were doing and um you know what they were coming out with and it inspired me and like a, you know a little bit of friendly competition that i think yeah, exactly. any artistic person has you know it keeps us it keeps us going so that was really like the big driving force i would say cool. yeah i've heard a lot of things about hotel and for somebody that's not like from around this area it's Cool to hear so many people started or were inspired by that. Yeah. So that's really great. It's uh, <clears throat> pretty incredible to me, like the number of poets that are in Erie. Yeah. Um, you know, and that, like, because of these places have existed, there's been these different readings that have been ongoing thanks to, you know, stalwarts of the poetry community. Um, you know, it's just kind of people get drawn to them. And I think that helps foster um, not, just the, not just the scene of poetry, but like us as writers. Yeah. 100 percent i've lived a lot of different places and Erie is probably the most poetic place i've lived um and we don't even have an excuse of having like an mfa program or something right it's even better just it's feels more like organic mm -hmm. yeah yeah so I, I, that's just really interesting to me um uh, i'm gonna hop kind of into your poetry uh, again um I recently read your new book. Um, my name is not, my, or sorry, my name does not belong to me. Um, I don't know if you can say that. Uh, and I had a really good time with it. There, it was, there's a lot of emotion behind it and that really um, had me like sit down and think a lot. And one of the reoccurring sort of themes in your book is sort of the intersection of like addiction, recovery, and family. Um, how are you able to sort of approach that intersection with such honesty? It's such like a tricky, place to find yourself as like a, as a reader. Um, so as a writer, I imagine it's even more. I think it's um, because like I have to be honest about those things. Um, like a, addiction was such a, there's so much energy spent in addiction of trying to like conceal things and only reveal the information that may benefit me at a certain, in, uh, you know, certain moment and to the certain person um, and like, to have to like completely remove myself from that um, and you know really get myself in like a different mindset and 
the things that are you know certainly most important to me you know are family and and, and recovery you know yeah. um, it's just like I, I think that one of the things that I've done consistently has been like write very honestly about things that are um, kind of painful and not maybe not always um, like and I look back at them I cringe a little bit because I wrote a lot in my addiction and I write a lot now um, and there's certain things that like maybe I don't want to say now that I have a kid right like I don't I don't want to talk about these certain things and I don't want to but whatever um, you know I wrote them um, and, and like I really hope that when I write something that it, even if you didn't go through the same experience you have like you can see the honesty and you know uh, I don't want to use the word bravery but like just the difficulty to share something painful and you can say well I didn't go through that but like I've gone through something painful and maybe I can you know I'm, I'm not alone and I can share that too you know yeah I absolutely think you accomplished that I, that was the thing I reflected on probably the most uh, in your poetry is that that bravery and that honesty thank you um, especially when like the honesty doesn't necessarily reflect well on right <laughs> yeah um, I think that's really hard to do so I thought that was kind of fascinating um, and kind of this actually flows right into really well into this you kind of talked about things that you um, don't want to necessarily write about as much and these like difficult emotions and another sort of thing I, I found really interesting in your poetry is Interesting, such a bad word to say. It makes it such. Anyway, one of the things I loved about your poetry is you tackle these difficult emotions, um, especially sort of anger and almost like vengeance. Um, it's something I noticed, especially in uh, there's a specific poem, which of course I did not write down. Yes, I did. Um, so especially in uh, the, the poem of your fourth step, mm -hmm. uh, there's definitely this notion of you're, you're sort of looking up these people. I think that's this poem. Um, I never felt vindicated by unconsciously seeking revenge. So you're, you're admitting these, these more negative feelings and that they didn't necessarily heal you, but you're still is admitting them and showing them. I think some poets fear those negative emotions, but you, you, you don't, you like, give it to us um, and can you speak to that I, I think we're all afraid of especially in our poetry sounding like dramatic or vile and I don't think that is at all about these poems but I think, oh, thank you I think you show us this. Uh, that's a high compliment to not be considered vile <laughs> um, I I don't know that Yeah, I just think that like it's it's about like, an honest expression um, for me, right? It's about trying to have an honest expression and like um, audience be damned kind of thing. Yeah. Um, because not everything's for everyone, and, and some poems, um, you know, there's a lot of like sculpting to do and, and you know yeah. peeling back the layers. Um, I just think that like it, it's who I am and it's what I dealt with and like. For me, um, when I'm most moved is usually, and I don't want to say it's moved by anger, but like I have anger, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, I certainly, I recognize that within myself and sometimes like it feels really novel and like to write about it is to kind of get like a, a cross section of it and to like, yeah. it's sort of like a, a therapeutic approach, which like I, I hate the idea of because like you're not here to listen to my therapy, but um, you know, sometimes maybe I put you guys through that anyways as an audience, you know, it's, as, uh, as a reader or a listener. Yeah. And I think nobody wants to write therapy, but also writing can be therapy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I think that's why there's so much like bad teenage poetry, you yeah. know, like I, I know I did it for, I know I did it for a really long time, you know, um, it, but that's where, the, that's where the spark is, right? So like, yeah. I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't quell it for anyone, you know? I wouldn't quell it for myself and I wouldn't quell it for uh, someone who's just excited about writing, you know? Like, we have to find ourselves and hone our voices and I'm still doing that, you know? Yeah, and sometimes you find that spark in different places. Absolutely, yeah, it certainly has changed, you know? Yeah. But sometimes it's more of a conscious effort. Where's that spark for you now? Oh, that's even something you can identify. That's I think like the biggest, the biggest pieces of inspiration for me lately have been other writers, mm -hmm. and just like because I, for a long time the 
most of my poetry exposure was at open mics or at, you know readings, and I, I got to hear them, right? But I, maybe I wasn't reading as, as much poetry or as wide a range of poetry. Uh, and now I am working to be better read uh, in that regard. And just like maybe sometimes it's it's how they end their lines and how it cuts against syntax, or maybe it's um, just like a certain emotion that it brings up, or it's a this like you know I have this conscious fear that like I, I need to really um, Clip, the, clip this bonsai tree down, right? And yeah. some people are, are like, they're okay with repeating themselves and having refrains and like, you know, just like, what is different for me? And like, can I try that? Can I try to put that mask on and just see what happens? Yeah, no, I, yeah, I think that's important. What are you reading right now? Or who's somebody important that you've read right now? To you, not. Sure, um, so last night, uh, my friend from Pittsburgh, who's a poet, uh, Scott Silsby, he sent me this giant box of books. Um, and I read some Richard Hugo and uh, Goodbye Iowa, and it just was like, oh, okay, like I get it, right? I, I get not not I get the poem, but I get why we write poetry, right? Like I can still be surprised and bowled over by it. Um, and uh, shameful as, as this is, like I I just finished The Great Gatsby for the first time uh, about a month ago, and like Scott Fitzgerald, F. Scott Fitzgerald is. He's got, there's so much meat uh, in every sentence, and I absolutely loved it and adored it, so. Yeah, and it's so relevant. Yeah. The world, like, it was written over 100 years ago at this point, and or about 100 years ago? It's, it's a long time ago, yeah. right? But it's so great. It, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Oh, he goes so good. No, I, I'm going to have to pick him back up. Awesome. No, um, I do have a couple other questions. Sure. Um, about your, your going, like sort of moving back to your poetry again. Sure. Uh, so some of your poetry, especially like Kingsley, Docket Sheet, Caesar, um, from your new, your newest book, uh, focus on like snapshots of the people that are connected to you, whether in the past or in the present. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes these people feel like distant goats, ghosts, not goats, uh, ghosts. <laughs> Other times, um, like they're living in your world. How do you integrate so many others into your writing without trivializing them. It can be really easy for people to become um, used by an author instead of actually like interacted with. You know, I, I, I worry that maybe I do use people. Um, I, I think it's, so I have a, a friend and a, a poet that I really admire named John Dorsey. And um, he just, he writes about people um, and I think it's a blurb on the back of one of his books, but it says, if John wrote a, if wrote a poem about you, it means he loves you, right? And like, he doesn't, it doesn't, he doesn't mean that they're, they're pretty or they're perfect or, they, or they're, um, you know, that they're doing noble things, but just that like he observed them. And um, like, what are we other than observers? You know, like there's no, uh, there's no objectivity, right? There's just a subjectivity and like, yeah. um, I'm, I'm free to explore that and like, you know, there's a poem in there about like a barber that I had once, right? You yeah. know, or um, there's just somebody that I saw in a church basement once. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just it. There's just these these people, and like there's, you know, like I have this mile high view, but I know that like some of those people I do get closer to, and like there's this whole world inside of them. Everyone's got this little infinity going on, and like, you know, but sometimes it intersects with mine, and like I, I'm gonna take it. You know, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna use it for what it is to me, and you know. It might be important or it might just be passing or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. No, the, the, the piece about the barber, that was uh, Caesar, that was one of my favorite poems in the book, I think, just because we're getting to observe with the, with the speaker, but we're also able to live in the speaker's mind while they're doing it. So I just thought that was really great. Um, so I'm just, I, I'm going to give one more question. I'm just going to let you go for the night. Okay. <laughs> um, so we talked um, a lot about, not a lot, but we talked some about like your time with poets, uh, with a poet hall, and starting off um, with what you know now about life and writing. What advice would you give to a poet just starting out? Um, write, you know, like just write without abandon. Um, for me, in the beginning, I did not want to be edited. Um, I didn't want to edit myself. So it was like very much first thought, best thought. And I think I got some great stuff out of that, but I think that there are little gems inside of some of them that I might have, that I might have thrown away otherwise. Um, 
you know, I think it's, I, I've recognized now how important it is to read, yeah. uh, to read other people. And like, for me, I have this, this tendency to just like, kind of, uh, this competition with other people, right? And like your success somehow diminishes my success. And that's like a, I'm not, I'm not cleansed of that by any, by any stretch, but like, uh, it's certainly smaller today than it was. And just the idea that like, there's other people who are great and like I can learn from and like I might not like their personality, but I might, but I might love their poems and I might not really love their poems, but I love their personality, you know, like um, it's just, a, I think it's just trying to be as wide as I can and um, not, and from, and like you had mentioned, <clears throat> we don't have an MFA program here. So this is kind of like street or like, uh, you know, we're poets who are uneducated, right? And we take a little bit of pride in that. And then like, but there's nothing wrong with being educated. You know, there's nothing wrong with, with learning about the classics or learning about mechanics or learning about um, uh, different uh, formal styles. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't, it's not gonna, it's, I'm not gonna lose my essence because I've learned something. And like, yeah. I was afraid of that for a long time. Yeah, I think that's a scary thing that we've all like had. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Luke. It was Thanks great chatting me. with you, and it was great reading your book, and uh, I hope we see you around here again sometime soon. I, I will be back, I promise. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.